In every culture and place, there's always something called unwritten rules or etiquette that you just kind of know that is passed on from generation to generation. This happens in cultures, it happens in families, it even happens in sports. An example of this is in baseball, there are unwritten rules that you, if you break these rules, that maybe even another rule affects it. One of the unwritten rules in baseball that maybe you know about, maybe you don't know, is if a no-hitter is going on, you're not supposed to say anything about it because it might jinx the pitcher. Another rule, in professional baseball at least, is that if you hit a home run, you're not supposed to stand at the plate and watch it. Instead, you're called to act like you have been there before. But if you do stand there and watch the home run, then the next time you're up to bat, you may get plunked by a baseball. It just doesn't make sense, some of these rules, by the way, but they've been passed on from generation to generation. This is in sports. You know, in families, there are unwritten rules as well that you just kind of know that are passed on from sibling to sibling and that you would tell people as they, as they came to your house as well. You know, one of the big rules in my family, and I was like the main advocate for this rule, was no hats in the house. It's kind of like no hats in church, right? But in home, it was no hats in church. And so some of my bro- in, in, in the house. And so some of my brother's friends would come over and they'd be wearing their hat. And right away I would tell them, get your hat off, what are you doing? Like it was the most unspeakable thing they could do. But it was just one of these rules that I knew, and so I wanted to spread it near and far. Now I'm sure there are unwritten rules in your family, or certain things that don't need to be spoken, you just kind of know them. And this is what's happening today in the gospel as well with the Pharisees. There's an, unspe- there's an unspoken rule with them, and it's all about taking the place of honor. Now, Jesus knows about this rule, and he goes out and he calls them out on it. At least he wants to disrupt them a little bit. So we have Jesus. Let's go back to the parable. We have Jesus going to the house of a leading Pharisee and goes to a great dinner with them, and it states, On the Sabbath, Jesus went to dine at the home of one of the leading Pharisees, and the people there were observing him carefully. They always observed Jesus carefully. But this time, he was observing them carefully as well. So he goes ahead and tells them a parable about those who have been invited. And notice that they were choosing a place of honor at the table. And this was driving, in a certain sense, Jesus, not nuts, but he was observing this. And he went to them and he stated, um, he went to them and he stated this certain parable. Now back then and even now to a certain extent, there was always places of honor that you could sit. But back then, this was the ultimate unwritten code that you would look around and you would see. Literally, the, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, the synagogue officials would look around and see who is the one person of honor here. And then they'd kind of go from seating that way, from the top to the lowest. And they'd just know, just by looking around, hmm, this is where I fit in by comparing themselves to others with their fellow guests, and then they'd be able to figure out where they are called to sit. And so Jesus calls them out on this and states, when you're invited to a wedding banquet, now by the way, whenever we hear the word wedding banquet, we should think in any parable that this actually is referring to the kingdom of God, because this is what Jesus is referring to. So when you're invited to a wedding banquet, okay, this isn't just a rule about etiquette, by the way. When you're invited to the kingdom of heaven, When you're invited to a place of honor, do not recline at this table in the place of honor. It goes on to state, A more distinguished guest than you may have been invited by him, and the host who invited both you may approach you and say, Give your place to this man. Now, if this were to happen, this would be a great shame. And this is one thing that everyone wanted to avoid back then. You wanted to have honor, but you wanted to avoid shame as much as possible. And then you would proceed with embarrassment when this happened. Once again, the word embarrassment here can be taken out and put in, and you would proceed with shame to the lowest place. Rather, when you are invited, go and take the lowest place. So when the host comes to you, he may say, my friend, move up to a higher position. So instead of shame, you enjoy the esteem or honor of your companions at table. Once again, this is more than just talking about etiquette. This is more than just saying, hey, look at me, I'm going to do this on purpose. This is about something else. So this is exactly what it comes down to. The whole point of the gospel account today is this. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself 
will be exalted. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And that's the key. The key for us is to humble ourselves. And when we do this, then we will be exalted by God. We have a tendency to always raise ourselves up or to try to find these places of honor. But in reality, what we are called to do is to humble ourselves. And when we do, who is going to exalt us? The hostess, our friend, as it states in the parable. The host will come and go to us. And the host, by the way, is God. He will be the one who exalts us. He will say, come to this higher place. You have humbled yourself in this world, and I will take you to a higher place. What does it look like to humble ourselves? Well, put very frankly, it means we do not look at ourselves and say we are the greatest thing since, since sliced bread. No, we are all great. Now we are all great people. Each and every one of us are great people. God created us. He did not create junk. So we know we're great, but it does not mean that we're called to go out there and say, hey, look at me. Look how great I am. He created greatness in you and I, but we cannot think that we are the best out there or that other people are not great as well. What we must do is humble ourselves and say, I am nothing but a lowly servant for God. But in that, there is greatness as well. And we live this life as a servant. We live this life to serve God, not to serve ourself. To humble oneself and to realize there is someone greater out there than us. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is God. And what we are called to do is serve him. And when we do this, we then are humbling ourselves. We know that we are called to do this, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well as we hear from Sirach. My child, conduct your affairs with humility, and you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. Humble yourself the more, the greater you are, and you will find favor with God. Humble yourself the more, the greater you are, and you will find favor with God. So the greater we think we are, the more we are called to humble ourself, to live this life of humility, to live this life of humble service to God. And of course, what we are doing is following the example of who? We are following the example of Jesus Christ, who humbled himself in taking on humanity, who humbled himself on the cross, who lived this out day in and day out, living his life humbly for us. So my brothers and sisters, this week, this life, this lifetime together, let us live this life with a life of giving and a life of humility. When we do this, we will receive the mercy and love that God wants to give us, and he will exalt us, not exalting ourselves, but let us let God exalt us by living humbly, humbly for God.